Before things get really hairy midweek in Ottawa, we get a chance right now to sit down with Hamilton Mountain MP Chris Charlton. Chris, thank you very much for joining us on this special edition. So you used to do opinionating on this uh, TV station all the time, and it was never special. Now you're a special edition. How does that feel? Thanks, Jason. <laughs> you're making me feel right at home here. Uh, the Olympics. Let's start with this. It's over, um, and we do have word from Ottawa, I guess, that the investment with this Own the Podium program isn't going to be like it was anymore. Yeah, unfortunately, the federal government has said it's not going to recommit to the levels that it's funded the program before. And you know what? Canadians are so proud of the efforts by, by Canada's amateur athletes. We, we, they had an amazing performance at these Olympics. We've taken on a record number of golds. Um, and yet at this very time when people are getting excited about enrolling their children in sports programs, at the very time that we're talking about needing to fight childhood obesity, the government is cutting the very programs that give kids a goal of excellence in sport. Yeah, and the kids got to be at this point, especially what with the games through, really looking forward to getting involved. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't send a very good message. You know, it's, it's funny though, Chris, you think about it before the Own the Podium program, all we did was talk about how we don't invest enough in our athletes, then we finally do, and what is it, didn't last very long, did it? No, unfortunately it didn't, and you know what, I, I was somebody who took issue with the, the notion of own the podium, um, while I absolutely uh, support the search for excellence. Uh, the reality is a whole lot of people are participating in sports, they're doing their very best, whether they win gold or not. These are incredible athletes that deserve our support, and if we want to nurture that notion of sportsmanship and athleticism, then we need to support them by making the programs affordable and accessible for our athletes, and by cutting the Own the Podium support, I think the federal government is doing a huge disservice to younger Canadians. Okay, let's take a break from the money aspect of the games and conclude with this. Did it effectively in Vancouver bring us together as a nation? Oh, I think when you look at the uh, fan support that the Olympics enjoyed right across the country, I think they absolutely did. There was a tremendous pride in our in our amateur athletes. You know, the final uh, story on these Olympics is going to be written later, and I'm sure there'll be many who will take a close look at the books and the financial aspects of the Olympics. But as Canadians, you know, if you were anywhere in our city last week and watched the enthusiasm, not just for the hockey games, which I guess you generally expect, but the new sports in the Olympics, Canadians were right behind our athletes, cheering them on every step of the way. And it was... Many of them were great moments of national pride that were unifying. All right, MP Chris, uh, you, you were right behind uh, the winners at the recent Hamilton Mountain uh, John C. Holland Awards. Uh, how'd it go? They were fantastic. I've been at many of the John C. Holland Awards dinners. I think this was the biggest one that we've ever had. The room was packed. The mood was fantastic. And I just want to say kudos to the organizers. They put on an amazing event. And it's always one of my favorite parts of Black History Month in our city. A lot of talents in the house annually Absolutely. with that one. All right. Uh, CISO's new Dawn Reception Center. While you've been home on this little prorogation and I won't call it a vacation because you Thank have been you. busy uh, that was uh, probably one of the highlights how inspired were you to see that community come together and did we ever find out who wrote this letter no you know what to the best of my knowledge I don't know who wrote the letter but as I said at the event itself you know one person with access to a photocopier is no match for our community for the compassion for the goodwill that exists in Hamilton and that event uh, at the at the New Dawn Reception Center was just it was a real community event it was a coming together of people who said you know what that kind of racism that kind of hatred has no place in our Hamilton and we'll stand together to make sure that our community is strengthened not weakened by one individual with access to a fax machine yeah, just remind everybody what that story was about um, well the, somebody who uh, who flyered the community in opposition to the new dawn reception center being uh, established on the mountain took uh, took issues and unfair jabs at uh, who the residents may be at that new dawn reception house and was essentially trying to make a case suggesting that uh, you know property values will uh, will go down as a result of this um, was trying to stir the pot and the community rose as one showed solidarity and said no in our hamilton there is a place for new dawn reception center and we're thrilled that it's in our neighborhood okay just as dalton starts rolling one in yours is over the pro rogue soon to be uh, finished uh, what's the the window of not doing what you normally would been, be doing uh, been like and are you looking forward to getting back at it 
I can't wait to be back in Ottawa. As you know, on uh, Wednesday, we start with the throne speech. On Thursday, we go right into the federal budget. Uh, you know, the, uh, the government prorogued the House in large part because it didn't want to deal with the issue of uh, Afghan detainees. That accountability will, of course, be uh, front and center again when oh, the House Oh, so you comes didn't back. forget. Oh, no, we <laughs> didn't forget. <laughs> And you know what? More importantly, I mean, the government gave as an excuse for the prorogation that it needed time to consult with Canadians. Well, anybody who has been following uh, what's been happening in our economy didn't need further consultation. We know that we need to have an aggressive economic agenda. We need to be dealing with jobs. We need to be dealing with EI. We need to be dealing with pensions. Those are the real issues that are confronting people in our community every single day. We shouldn't have prorogued for three months. We should have been dealing with those issues in Ottawa since January when the House was scheduled to come back. And I can't wait to get back into the House to hold the government to account for making people wait two additional months before they could get help from their federal government. Can you try to get inside uh, the Conservatives' head? Can you <laughs> try to share with us what you may hear in the next couple of days from them? Well, you know, unfortunately, uh, Jim Flaherty has been pretty blunt about uh, what his agenda is going to be. He said as far back as December that uh, as a result of the deficit uh, that, that's resulted um, in terms of the economic stimulus package and some of the money they've had to spend on infrastructure, he's now saying his agenda will include privatization and it will, uh, will include program cuts. We've seen that movie before here in Ontario. I mean, many will remember when Jim Flaherty was the finance minister under Mike Harris. Um, that is the government that gave us Walkerton. Uh, we don't want to see a replay of that here on a national level and I think it's absolutely incumbent upon all of the opposition parties to say we don't want a repeat of what we saw in Ontario under Mike Harris. We need to make sure that people end up being better off. We still haven't recovered from the Harris cuts in Ontario to this day. When you say privatize and cut, privatize what, cut what? That's what I mean. Are you, are you thinking ahead? Are you prepared to hear what it is that they want to privatize or do you know? Well, I think, you know, to, to a large extent, they've signaled what their, what their agenda is going to be. Um, you know, if you look at uh, some, of the, some of the programs like our, our nuclear assets, they're talking about selling those. Um, with respect to uh, deregulation, you've seen, that, you've seen that start to play out already, whether it's with respect to uh, environmental issues or whether it's with respect to health care. I think there's a whole range of issues that we need to be very, very vigilant about because the reality is not everything that they intend to do has to come before the House of Commons. Much they can do by, by regulation, and the devil, as always, with this government is in the details. Okay, you want to talk about uh, retirement plans and what the Ontario government intends to do uh, in comparison to your federal government? Well, I know you've had Andrea on the show, and she's talked eloquently about, uh, about the need for provincial uh, pension reform. That same issue, of course, is front and center at the federal government. With uh, so many pension plans now being underfunded, with companies on the brink of bankruptcy, Canadians are profoundly worried about the future of their uh, retirement income security. And, of course, that income security depends on a number of things. First and foremost, the universal system is the OAS and the GIS. And as you know, we've been uh, advocates of increasing the GIS because seniors are finding it almost impossible to make ends meet right now. Everything is going up except for their income. And it's only going to get worse when the HST is added onto things like heat, like hydro, like electricity uh, come July. There's also the CPP, of course, uh, which is no longer adequate. Uh, so we have a proposal that, uh, that we have been working on in Ottawa that is now a public proposal um, that allows for the potentially the doubling of benefits of, of CPP, um, benefits that are being paid to Canadians. And the final piece, of course, is, uh, is company pension plans, making sure that when companies do go bankrupt, that the innocent victims of those bankruptcies who are the workers who for years have contributed to pension plans don't lose their pension benefits as a result of that. This is pretty serious stuff, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, um, when people go to work, they do that in good faith. They negotiate wages, they negotiate benefits, they negotiate pensions. And what we've seen, you know, you'll recall it, it happened at CH. It's certainly, uh, you remember the CCAA protection at Stelco. At the stroke of a pen, the reality will change for people in their retirement planning. This is, these are bread and butter issues and people are losing their homes. They're worried about, uh, about their futures. They haven't done anything wrong and we need to protect them. Uh, other items on your wish list. We'll get to that in just a bit. We'll take a quick break right now. Okay, MP Chris? Absolutely. MP Chris Charlton, our special guest on this Monday edition of For the Record. 
More with her in just a moment. Stay tuned.